This is episode 10 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. What is your opinion in world history about individuals who have been in power? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on what they did with the power. But how important has the individual been? Well, I mean, you, 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 the question you've raised, of course, is the classic uh, of, you know, do people make history or are people made by history? Um, and, of course, you know, I'm going to split hairs here and suggest it's something of both, um, that uh, it's a combination of the circumstances which then afford exceptional leaders the opportunity to, to lead. Um, had, one sense, Teddy Roosevelt lamented the fact that he didn't have a war, um, that uh, the way great presidents established their greatness, um, and of course Lincoln being his hero, uh, and you could look at Washington, you could look at, uh, at other presidents, was it a fact um, uh, in combat? Um, if Lincoln had been president uh, in another time, would he cut anywhere near the same figure? Um, who, so, in, who in world history are your favorite? Well, of course, de Gaulle was my hero. I think de Gaulle is, um, and I understand he's not, he's not someone that uh, is widely popular among Americans. Um, who was he? Charles de Gaulle was um, a literally larger-than-life figure. Born in 1890, uh, a military man who defied the military establishment of his day. For example, um, tactically and strategically, the uh, the prevailing um, credo of the French army was uh, defensive. Uh, this was the lesson learned from World War One with trench warfare. You uh, you couldn't be offensive if uh, the other side was armed with machine guns and tanks and poison gas. De Gaulle, on the other hand, was a very early advocate of the tank and the mobility that the tank afforded um, the creative commander. But, but, you know, De Gaulle's greatest act of defiance came in 1940 when the French government fell it had been rotting away for years. And when the Nazi blitzkrieg overrun, uh, overran much of France, and uh, those in power in Paris um, looked at the odds, and um, what seemed to them to be the only rational course, and gave way, signed an armistice, and then were replaced by a Nazi collaborationist government led by, ironically, de Gaulle's former mentor, a very elderly hero of World War I, uh, Henri Philippe Pétain, Marshal Pétain, who many people believe was at least on the edge of senility at that point. But anyway, Pétain um, and his collaborationist government um, basically yielded to Hitler's Victory. De Gaulle refused to. Uh, he believed that uh, France was a, a mystical, um, honorable entity that was, at that point at least, inculcated in him. He left Paris at great risk, flew to, uh, across the Channel to London, established himself in the middle of June 1940 as the incarnation of something called Free France which at that point really existed in his imagination only. He gave a famous radio speech on the 18th of June in which he said France has lost a battle, but France has not lost the war. And he shared a vision, which by and large came true. Um, and um, so the irony is that de Gaulle, who was seen as an authoritarian figure, was in fact defined by his, his willingness to defy authority. For the rest of the war, um, most of that time using London as his base, 
um, he built free France. He uh, brought uh, many of the French colonies in Africa, for example, to his standard. Uh, Vichy condemned him to death in absentia, but over time Vichy lost whatever claim to any sort of moral authority that it had. And and the de Gaulle movement gained steadily. Um, who is, by the way, who is Vichy? Vichy is a town in France known previously for Vichy water, and it became the temporary capital um, of what I would call collaborationist France um, from 1940 until the end of the war. Um, the... Um, De Gaulle made some enemies. He, um, Churchill was his great sponsor, but you have to remember, for De Gaulle to succeed, intransigence was was necessary. He had to make people to believe, out of thin air, that he, he and something called Free France were real. That there was, in fact, a mass popular movement. Uh, of resistance that was willing um, to die in the name of France. How often was he elected? He, um, at the end of the war, became, in effect, a kind of provisional president. But he was not a man uh, who was uh, uh, accustomed to working with parties. Remember, French democracy before the war was notorious for a change of of, uh, of of leadership, um, and uh, the instability the instability of the French political system was something that De Gaulle found um, at that point in his life beyond his control. So he walked away in 1946, and for 12 long years was uh, what De Gaulle admirers referred to as crossing the desert. He retired to his country home at Colombe de Deux Églises which is not that far from the German border in northeast France, and waited for the French people to call him back, and waited and waited. And then in May 1958, the call came because of the Algerian War. Uh, Algeria was a French colony. Uh, there was a rebellion uh, underway. Uh, France, in effect, proposed to, to give Algeria its independence. Well, of course, the French colonial forces didn't want to be independent. Um, civil war was threatened in France, and eventually uh, it reached the point where the parties even were desperate enough to send for the one man who it was thought might be able to damp down the immediate crisis. Um, de Gaulle brilliantly flew to Algiers. <laughs> he was, he was a, a master of... Um, Oh, uncertainty? Um, he stood on a balcony before a cheering crowd of these rebels and said, I understand you. And, of course, they took that to mean that he supported them. Uh, in fact, it was exactly the opposite. And as a result, he would be the, the uh, target of at least six assassination attempts, um, some of which came very close to succeeding. Um, that were grounded in, in Algeria in resistance from the far right wing elements that wanted to keep French Algeria French. What was his <clears throat> relationship to the United States? Well, it was uh, problematic, and unfortunately, he was grateful, genuinely grateful, for the assistance that the people of the United States gave to free France during the war. Unfortunately, FDR took an instant disliking to de Gaulle. It's, it's one of the things I think that even many admirers of Roosevelt scratch their heads over. Um, he thought de Gaulle had the makings of a dictator. He was not alone in that. But de Gaulle, in one of his classic uh, one-liners, said, don't they know I'm too old to be a dictator? Which, when you stop to think about it, is a pretty shrewd observation. He, Churchill referred to him as, we all have our crosses to bear. And in fact, de Gaulle was, was one of his. They had a, a stormy relationship, but one ultimately that was based in great mutual respect. So when de Gaulle became uh, president of France, he created the Fifth Republic uh, in 1962. 
and then was elected by popular vote, overwhelmingly elected uh, president of France and served until 1969 when um, clearly the tide had turned. He'd been in power for 11 years. His historical mission in many ways had been accomplished. And he, he left. Many people think he deliberately provoked a situation, uh, a minor referendum on reform of the French government. And he said if, if he lost, he would, he would quit. Of all the people, though, that you could mention, why de Gaulle and when did you first get yeah. interested in him? And, and how did you go about learning about him? Why? Because, among other things, first of all, the figure himself, he's this towering classical throwback in many ways. Um, uh, he was a, he spoke of himself in the third person, and he was profoundly, I think, self-knowledgeable when he said, um, de Gaulle is a man of the day before yesterday and the day after tomorrow. Which, when you start thinking about it, leaves a rather large uh, hole. Um, and I, I suppose I'm probably um, prone to sympathize with that point of view. Uh, I, I would, I would probably be happier living uh, the day before yesterday. I don't know about the day after tomorrow. I have some problems with the, the contemporary but, scene. But when, go back to the when you first as a child. I, I um, how young I became aware of him really in 1958. I was six, <laughs> six um, when uh, when he came back to power. I mean, he was a name at that point, but but I you know. I I followed him and and by the early sixties had had latched onto him. Stop and think of all the great figures, the towering figures, evil and good, associated with World War Two. No one started with the West in terms of tangible resources, support, organization, legitimacy, recognition, uh, you name it. No one started with the West and created more. And it was in no small measure the creation of de Gaulle's imagination, uh, vision. He famously wrote, he wrote, he wrote the extraordinary war memoirs, um, three volumes of, of war memoirs, which start out with the famous line, all my life I have thought of France in a certain way. And to him, it was the France of the, of the Madonna and the tapestries and 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 a, and a, you know medieval greatness. Clearly, it's France of the day before yesterday, and that concept of grandeur, French grandeur, is synonymous with De Gaulle, and I I find that terribly attractive. Where would you send someone who says, "Oh, I'm intrigued now. I want to know more about him"? Well, there are a number <clears throat> of biographies, very fine biographies. What about his memoir? Yeah, the memoir is it's 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 elegant literature. De Gaulle, um, um, another thing, De Gaulle was a great writer. He he is this, as I say, a throwback uh, like Caesar. He was a great soldier, a great civilian leader, and a great teller of his own story. And there aren't many of those on the world scene. What about a biography? Um, there are a number of. Um, there's a uh, two volume actually in French it's three volumes uh, by a man named and I'm forgive me my pronunciation is not very Jean Lacatour I believe is uh, but two volumes uh, that were that were the first volume was published in 1990 at the time of the De Gaulle centenary published here it's originally published in France in three volumes um, there's a man named Don Cook who wrote a very fine one volume biography called The Last Great Frenchman. Um, and finally, um, uh, is it John Fenby? He wrote a biography of Chiang Kai-shek, but he also wrote a book called The General, which is a much more recent, uh, and which incorporates a lot of, for example, the De, De Gaulle papers and, and uh, more recent research. Who would be Jonathan num- Fenby. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who would be number two on your list? Well, of course, I've, yeah, I'm a Churchill fan. Um, if, if in my apartment I have, I think four, four shelves of books on Churchill. Um, you read them all? Most of them. Um, for example, there's the um, 
in this format the the eight volume official biography by Martin Gilbert, which you you dip into. Um, I I think William Manchester, the two volumes that he wrote, are, are among the finest historical literature that I've ever read. And I know Manchester takes some hits from professional and academic historians, but nobody can match Manchester's narrative gifts. He, he just literally, he, there are very few authors of whom I think you can honestly say, when you pick up the book, you cannot put it down. I, I tell people the best single biography I've ever read is, is Manchester's Life of Douglas MacArthur, uh, American Caesar. The best political biography I've ever read, not that you're asking, but um, is a T. Harry Williams, Huey Long. So there, there, there are a couple of books that people can go out and read and, well, and really enjoy. While we're on it, uh, something you mentioned, the academic uh, biography compared to the uh, more commercial. What's the difference? Well, I, you know, I get in trouble sometimes um, because I insist there shouldn't be a difference. Uh, I am, I guess, in a minority, a distinct minority there. I mean, I think great biography is a, is obvious. It, it has to be rigorously researched. It has to include, if you will, academic standards in terms of the evidence that you're marshalling. But having done that, it seems to me that's half the job. The second half, and in some ways maybe even the more important half is crafting that information, first in a way that is intellectually honest and rigorous, but secondly, that is readable and hopefully compellingly readable. How, how, did, how did you learn to read? And, and what would you say is your technique? <clears throat> to read. To read. In other words, do you read fast? Do you read slow? Do you read I'm convinced nights, that, mornings? I mean, nothing very profound here. I swear you, you read much faster and with a different level of comprehension if it's a, it's a subject you're, you're already interested in. I, I can remember, literally, the weekend um, in 1978, yeah, it was 78, when American Caesar was published. I mean, to me, an event, a book is an event, in the way that for some people a Star Wars movie is an event around which they build their calendar. Um, you know, I, I, I look ahead and see what's coming down the road. And, um, you know, I'll build that day and some days around getting that book as soon as I can. And, and I can remember American Caesar, I bought it, and I spent the weekend in my apartment in Boston in what was then called Longfellow Place um, near Beacon Hill. And I didn't leave the apartment for three days. I read uh, I read the book from cover to cover, and it's a it's a big book, but it's absolutely riveting. Um, you take now, notes? They're, they're at, no, I don't. And that, that's an, it's a good question. I've never taken. Now I do for research purposes, obviously, but but that was um, what it is is it's the equivalent of a great movie, or sometimes a great theater work. It's all about abandoning the dreary, contemporary existence, <laughs> um, however you define that, uh, exchanging that credibly, emotionally, and intellectually, uh, inhabiting another time and place. Um, great authors can, in fact, transport you. Um, it, it requires talent on their part and imagination on yours um, but it's you know it's perfectly possible in the way that you lose yourself in a in a in a great movie Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author you can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org <laughs>